anyone know who this young man is? Is it Benjamin? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yes. Yes. He, he is the Weird Wales kid, yeah. So Benjamin is... Last year, he was the world's youngest generative art artist. Um, when he was 12 years old, he made $200,000 in one evening when he minted the Weird Wales collection. And then from there, he went on to be an NFT celebrity. Um, his, his collections combined have now seen $20 million in transaction sales. He's been in mainstream media like BBC, The Guardian, New York Post, um, lots of other publications in blockchain and crypto publications as well. He's speak, spoken at uh, NFT NYC, the Global NFT Summit, NFT Lisbon, and obviously here at Zebu Live as well. Um, and he's also holds the title of youngest ever guest lecturer at Oxford University, which was back in November. And he's speaking again there next week, right? Yes. So put your hands together for Benny Ben Ahmed. So thank you for the introduction, Matt. And I've got a list of all your achievements here. There's quite a lot of them. So Matt's the CEO and co-founder of iPushPull, which is an enterprise SaaS platform for capital markets. And he's also the co-founder of Ranscork, which is the world's leading real-time analysis and news audio service for traders. And before startup life, Matt was a trader at Refco and also worked at RBC. And Matt studied at Imperial College and City University. He's also the co-founder of Work in Fintech, which is a project I'm also involved with. And it was launched to help young people understand and be aware of Web3 and blockchains and how you don't want to go to Goldman Sachs, you want to go to Web3. It's much more interesting, there's so many more jobs, and it's a much more lively atmosphere. So Matt's an also an equally impressive person. Put your hands together for Matt as well. Thanks, Ben. Do you want to go to the next slide? So today we're going to be talking about Web3 data and analytics. Um, and just before we jump into that, why is Web3 on-chain data so important? Well, it's incredibly disruptive because it's, it's all free, it's open source, it's permissionless, and it's not owned by any one company. It's obviously decentralized. Um, and it's immutable, which means it's impossible to change. You can't hack it. You can't do anything with it. Can we go to the next slide, uh, Ben? So today we're going to be looking at Web3 data analytics for digital art. Um, and we're going to be using a platform called NFT Go, which is one of the work in FinTech partners. Um, why are we choosing digital art to start off with? Well, it's the one NFT area where there's been product market fit. But beyond that, there's obviously tons of areas where there's going to be product market fit in time, such as capital markets, that's my background, ticketing, consumer goods, all the other things that we're looking at there. So we did do some sacrificial offerings earlier, and the technology gods are looking down on us so far. So, so, so far, so good. So Ben, do you want to kick off? Yep, so today we'll be displaying NFT Go. And first, I'm going to have a look at the user profile page. So here we have the wallet. NFT Go has identified that it's a whale and also a super blue chip holder. And here we have some three simple analytics. We can see the amount of NFTs this address owns, which is currently 6,280. We can also see the amount of collections this address owns and the top holding, which is currently Punk's Comic. These are pretty simple analytics, but if we go over here, we see some interesting numbers. So here is estimated holding value. And estimated holding value is the number of NFTs the address holds times by the estimated price of each NFT. And the current estimated holding value of this wallet is 15,220 ETH, which, if we hover over it, about $20 million. Ooh, that's a lot. Holding value is the sum of the last price of each NFT held by the address. And currently, that's around 3,930 ETH. And if we subtract the two numbers, we get the PL, which is around 11,310 ETH. And the PL is the sum of realized profit made from sales and unrealized profit um, of NFTs held by this address. And beneath it, we've got buy volume, which is 2,890 ETH, and sell volume, which is 248 ETH. We've also got related addresses and activities, and I'll get into these two later down this talk. 
So over here, we can see an overview of his NFTs, and we can filter by different collections. If we move to the stats tab, we get some pretty interesting graphs. So over here, we've got cumulative gains and losses, and you can filter by P&L estimated holding value and holding value and over different time periods. So this is reflecting what's seen here in a graph format. This is just loads. So here's holding distribution, and we can see that 18% of the NFTs in this portfolio are Punk's comic, and this reflects what we saw over here. And here we've got related addresses. Now, this is an interesting graph because it's something you can't do with the traditional stock market. Imagine if I could see all the addresses that one Warren Buffett's has, account has interacted with. The, that feature alone would make Web3 so powerful, but we have so many more features. So if we go to relational graph, we can see all the addresses this wallet has sent ac assets to and all the um, addresses which have sent assets to this wallet. And again, NFT Go has identified whether it's a wallet or a contract. So often you hear stories on Twitter of people getting hacked. And the people that are looking into this hack and the FBI, they would l use graphs such as this to see where the funds have been sent to. So if the funds have been sent to an exchange, usually you can find out who the hacker is as they would need KYC to log into that exchange. To the left, we have trades, and we can see that in the lifetime of this account, it's bought 640 NFTs and sold 40 NFTs, and we can also see in a graph format over here. And below, we have the collections this address is bought into in a table format. So if we look at Azuki, he currently holds 65 Azuki NFTs, and his buy volume is around 959 ETH. And his P&L is currently in the negatives, minus 800. 83 ETH. We can also find some NFTs that he's made profit from. from. For example, um, other deed for other side. He's bought 242 of those NFTs and he's made a profit of 686 ETH. So that's the stats tab. We can also have a look at activity and this is all the activity across this wallet. Again, we can filter by different time periods and here we can see all the different events and exactly when they happen. So he received this NFT 13 hours ago. And lastly, we have Mira. So Mira is a platform where you can write blogs and you log in with your crypto account. So we can see all the blogs this address has written. So he hasn't written any, but if we go to another wallet, we might see some blogs appear here. So now I can hand over to Matt, who's going to talk about analytics on a collection level rather than a user level. Thanks, Ben. Um, so, so firstly, just pointing out the obvious, all of this data is free. You know, you, you, anyone can query it. It's all on chain. Put that into perspective of what you're seeing in traditional markets. Like, my, like I said, my background is financial markets. Financial market data is a $50 billion a year revenue um, sector. But all of this data we're looking at is free. So you can kind of see the disruptive element there. So looking at the um, collection level, and also just going to NFT Go as well. This is all free to use. You know, you can connect your wallet, give it a go. Um, looking at collection level, similarly, you've got stats. So, for example, you've got market cap over on the right-hand side. Uh, at the moment, 853,000 ETH. What's that in dollars, Ben? Like a billion and a half or something. It's a billion and a half of some monkey JPEGs. They're doing pretty well. Um, you can then see how many NFTs in the collection. So, on the left-hand side, you can see um, just up the top, Ben, You've got how many NFTs there are in the collection, what type of contract it's used, um, other information like holders on the right. So you've got 6,500 holders. So that's out of a collection of 10,000. So you can see it's not too skewed just towards whales. You've got other stats like volume and floor price and so on. Floor price obviously being the last and lowest um, listed price. If you scroll down, Ben, we can obviously other stats like price. You can change the, the metrics and the time frames. You've got market cap and volume and how that trends. And then you've got things like transactions and liquidity at the bottom. Um, what you can see is uh, on the right-hand side with holders and traders, you can actually see it's a pretty steady line with that green line at the top because most people are just hodling their bored apes. And also, you can, if you hover over some of these, um, this bit over here, Ben, you can see actually the liquidity of the market is pretty poor. There's only a couple of buyers and sellers in any given day, but that's because of the fact that 
it's so expensive to buy a board ape. The cheapest one that's listed at the moment is 100,000 bucks. But all this type of information, again, it's all available for free on chain and in platforms like NFTGo and some others then present it in this very usable way. Um, do you want to go up to listings at the top, uh, Ben? Yeah, so listings, again, you've got some more interesting um, kind of components of different collections. And just scroll down, Ben. And then floor depth is an interesting one. So this essentially is showing you uh, the prices in aggregate across all exchanges. So any exchange that's listed anywhere, it will show you all of the listings. So you can see what it's showing here is actually this big bar at the top that's purple. That's showing where most board apes have been listed at. So it gives you kind of the, you know, where the most volume is looking to be. Obviously, there's always someone trying to sell it for silly money, like you can see on the right-hand side, and some people selling it cheaper, but that's a market, right? Um, you've got, also got information about, yeah, who's been putting stuff up, and again, cross-exchange, um, and then recent sales cross-exchange as well. Yeah, back to you, Ben. Yes, so now we'll look at the leaderboard, and this is a cool feature that you can use to benchmark your performance against other market participants, or really just check what the top traders are buying. So if I scroll down here, I see some familiar names. For example, Pranksy. For those of you who don't know, Pranksy is the identity who bought a thousand Bored Apes at Mint. And obviously, Bored Apes wouldn't have gone to the price they're currently at if one wallet held that much percentage of the collection. But he did go to proceed to sell all of his Bored Apes. And we can see that in his lifetime, he's minted 18,793 NFTs and his P&L shown here is around 14,630 ETH, which is around $30 million. So obviously, this information will be of high interest to the HMRC. <laughs> we can also have a look at marketplaces, and here we can compare different marketplaces such as X2Y2, OpenSea, or LooksRare. So if we do volume, we can see that X2Y2 in the last seven days is beating OpenSea in terms of volume, but there's a cool feature that Matt will get into later called filtering wash trades on NFT Go. And if we toggle this, we can then see X2Y2 getting squashed all the way down and OpenSea leading it again. So with X2Y2, they have a cool feature where you can stake tokens, and those who have staked the tokens can receive the royalties from the different collections made. And obviously, through this, many people have just washed traded to try and get what they're earning up. Here we've got traders, and we can also compare the different traders on the different platforms. So in the last seven days, there have been 152,000 traders on OpenSea. That's so small compared to the billions we can onboard to NFTs. And again, we see this information in the table format, and we can look at the volume and the different fees on the platforms. We can also move to top sales and have a look at the top sales across multiple time periods. So in the last 24 hours, this Azuki sold for 105 ETH. So obviously, rare NFTs in different collections do attract high prices. We can have a look at newly added and see the newly added collections to NFT Go and again see how many minters there have been in the past 24 hours or 30 days or whatever time you filter by. We can also have a look at the market cap. So obviously, many traders come to this tab when they're looking for upcoming mints and what's popping on the market right now. We can have a look at top mints. And again, traders also use this to see which mints have been doing well um, over the last five. Again, we can filter here five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, all the way up to 24 hours. And we can see the mint price, how many mints there have been, and also the mint trend over here. Again, we have top collections, and on every page you can see there's always a place where you can filter by different time periods. So in the last 24 hours, ENS Ethereum name service has been the top collection with a volume of 2,830 ETH. And now I can hand over to Matt, who's going to look at this page in the market overview. So again, I'll just say again, this is all free data, right? Anyone can query this. So market overview. So this is actually looking at the entire NFT market. So you can see, I don't know if you quite read it at the top, but there's listed 3,700 or so collections, and there's 34.5 million NFTs in total. 
And how big's that market? So if we scroll down, just go down the page, Ben, you've got market cap and volume. Right, so if you've got market cap here on the left, 9.7 million ETH. And just change that into dollars, Ben. So that's $22 billion. That's actually really, really, really tiny. Do you know what the market cap of Tesco, the supermarket, is? It's more than that. So just goes to show how early things are at the moment. It's like super, super early. Put it into perspective with the equity markets. Equity markets are $80 trillion, right? And this is $20 billion the size of Tesco. What it means is that we're really early and there's so much headroom, so much things and excitement and great stuff that can be built from here on. Um, so if you also just change the, uh, the, the, uh, the time scale to all, Ben. So obviously we saw NFTs peak in January or so this year, but that wasn't just NFTs, that was every single market on the planet because of macro conditions, because of inflation and interest rates and people scared of recession and so on. So NFTs have just been hit with that as well. well what's quite interesting with this, you can see it goes back to, I think it's like 2017 uh, or so here, um, and if you start looking at some of the volume very early on, it's obviously very small. OpenSea started somewhere around here, and OpenSea was going to throw in the towel somewhere around here as well because things weren't picking up. And then you got to Christmas, I think it was 20, 2021, um, and then, and, oh, 2020, 2021? Yeah, Christmas 2020. Um, and then things really started picking up, and then you saw that exponential growth, and now OpenSea kind of dominates the market in that respect. Um, just go up, Ben. You've got the blue chip index. So this is a collection. This is like a barometer, a good thing to look at, like the S&P 500 index. But it's a blue chip index actually showing uh, the average prices of the top 16 collections. So it's things like doodles and cool cats and bored apes and crypto punks and so on. So it's a really good indicator to look at. Um, and then if we just go down, Ben, to the different categories, category market cap. So this is my favorite piece of all the analytics on this particular platform. And the reason being, going back to that thing that NFTs are the size of Tesco, right? And, all, and, and look at that as well. This says, that says PFP if you can't see it. That's about $13 billion. So all the stuff everyone's getting really excited about is tiny. Um, but what's really interesting is that over time, all of these categories, I don't know if you can quite read them, but we've got like games, collectibles, art, metaverse, utility, and so on. In the future, you're going to see loads of categories on here. Uh, one of the things that we want to get added on here is corporate sponsorship, because that's what we're doing with work in fintech, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but over time, you'll see things on there like equities, bonds, FX, real-world um, tokenized assets, real estate. All of these things will start happening on there, and you'll start seeing that go from 20 billion one day to 200 trillion or whatever the number's going to be. But again, think about the equity market, 80 trillion dollars, this is 20 billion. So that just shows how early we are in, in everything that we're doing. Really, as well, to think about, you know, everyone kind of makes the comparisons, you know, today in NFTs is the same as the internet was in 1995. It's all open for everyone to, you know, to make, to make opportunities, everything that's there. Um, and just go back up, Ben. I think you touched on some of the marketplaces and so on, but one thing just be good to mention as we go into wash trades later, if you go to top sales and just put it on all. So now we can see all of the NFT sales ever in history. And some of you might recognize the one at the top, so that's CryptoPunk 9998. And how much did that sell for? 124,000 ETH, which is $530 million. But no one actually did that. You know, that was, a, that was a flash loan and a wash trade, and someone basically just artificially pumping up the price. Um, but at this, this type of thing you can look at and understand with, with using these analytics. Uh, back to you, Ben. Thank you, Matt. So this is well tracking, and we can, again, a whale on NFT Go is someone who holds more than $1 million worth of NFTs, and we can track what these whales are minting over different time periods. So I have a look at the last 30 days. We can see that there have been 40 whales who minted the art box collection, 40 whales minted from the art blocks collection, and they bought a total of 279 NFTs. And we can see how much volume that was, the total volume, the current floor price. We can have a look at all these different collections. So the world tracking, we can also have a look at mints as well as trades. And again, we can see how many whales minted how many NFTs from each collection. 
So if you look at the last 24 hours, five whales minted 18 NFTs from this collection. I actually minted from this collection, so it's quite cool to see it up here. Then activity, we can have a look at all of this in a graph format and see there's um, currently 125 active whales in the last 24 hours, and they've bought a total of 491 NFTs. And again, we can see all the different buy, sell, transfer events. And here is a list of all the whales. And again, Pranksy should be somewhere here. Yeah, here he is again. So this is whale tracking, and now I can talk to you about watch lists. So a cool feature on NFT Go, you can set up watch lists for looking at collections, looking at different addresses, or looking at individual NFTs. So we start off at collections, we can see that these are the current collections that I want to watch. We can see how much volume they've had and what the current floor is. And again, we can see all the different events for all the different collections. Here we've got addresses. So if I monitor these three addresses, I can see, again, what they're minting, what they're receiving, what they're buying. And if I look at some of the individual NFTs, for example, this cool CryptoPunk, the alien CryptoPunk, I can track it, see the floor price of the collection, not the floor price of this NFT, and also the rarity rank identified by NFT Go. So now Matt is going to talk to you about wash trades. Yeah, so wash trades is, is something that you can actually filter out in this particular platform. And why that's important is wash trades is basically people spoofing the market, people colluding between one another, people who might own something and they're just transferring it between wallets to look like there's transactions. It's basically pump and dump. In financial markets, it's illegal and you go to prison. But NFTs are not regulated yet, so it's still not common, but it's not uncommon. But it's something that you can actually filter out on here, so it's a good, a good feature to, to use. And it's also good to think about if you're looking at you know, collections and so on, um, being able to filter that out. Can you just go back to um, analytics and um, just the top collections again? Just one thing that's quite... Um, if you go to the an analytics at the top, at the very top. Oh, sorry. Very, very top, yeah. Market overview, top collections. And just go to top collections. And one thing that's kind of worth noting as well is all these collections, um, they're, most of them are owned by one company. Um, they are Yuga Labs owns at least five out of the ten of the top... Uh, five out of ten of the uh, top NFT collections. So again, it's something to think about. That will obviously change over time because more entrants are going to come into the market. But again, because it's so early, you're seeing massive skews in the market, like OpenSea is skewed in the exchange space. Yuga Labs is, is skewed in the NFT space. So all of that will change over time. Um, so just to wrap up, do you want to go on to the slides, um, Ben? And we'll just kind of finish up. So... Like I said at the beginning, everything is open source, everything is free. And that's what's very different with blockchain data versus financial market data or any other data that you kind of have to pay for. Um, with NFT Go, it's, you know, we, we went through it, it's free to use, so give it a go. How they monetize it is they have a trading aggregator, so if you wanted to buy something, it's kind of this kind of money supermarket.com type uh, setup where you can get like the cheapest price out there. And just quickly, we'll just talk about work in fintech, and then I'll let Ben wrap up. So work in fintech is something that, that um, myself, Ben, Imran, his dad, and, and another lady set up um, about 18 months ago. And essentially, we help um, young students from Ben's age all the way up through to, to kind of young people get into fintech and Web3. So we help mentoring, we do coaching, we, we do teaching, we help provide work placements and work experience. So we've done things from anything from Goldman Sachs to Revolut through to NFT Go and companies like that. How you can kind of back work in fintech and, and, and get involved. Yeah, if there's any companies here and you want to get involved in work in fintech, you want to become a sponsor, um, you want to help with work experience programs and so on, then come and give us a shout. But we do have an NFT collection as well. It's actually the world's first B2B NFT collection. So we're selling our NFTs to companies. So we've got people like TPI Cap, who's the world's biggest broker. We've got like blockchain.com and a few other big companies and, and obviously NFT Go as well, who, who are helping back the project. So yeah, do check us out. Um, we've got an NFT newsletter as well. If you want to check it out, it's the QR code on the right-hand side. Um, but I'll let Ben wrap up. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Matt, and everyone, thank you for attending the session. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm just going to quote my dad here and give him a little shout-out. 
So my dad has been a developer in financial markets for nearly 25 years, and he often says that if crypto only delivered on two promises, made the markets operate 24-7 without any downtime, and made them more transparent as we've seen in today's demo, then it would revolutionize the entire economy. However, we can do a lot more. 95% of applications for crypto and NFTs are still waiting to be discovered. That's definitely really exciting. Everyone, please do keep in contact. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. My user handle is on screen. And you can also connect with Matt through the Work in Fintech Twitter and Matt's personal LinkedIn. On Twitter, I mainly focus on education and share everything I learn as I continue to venture further down this rabbit hole. Everyone, thank you for listening to the talk.